My name is Richard Casper. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I teach a course here at the School Institute of Chicago. This program started basically because after my injuries in war, I didn't know how to deal with myself. I came back, had a brain injury, my best friend was shot, killed. I didn't know myself at that point. Art has helped me by giving me a chance to have a voice again. I used to not be able to leave my house. I couldn't go talk to people. I would physically throw up and get sick. If you could be 0% that's committing suicide, 100% being the best you can be. After the Marine Corps, after being injured, I was at probably like a 9 or a 10. And after the school, I was back to like 85% me. For people who may struggle like I did and didn't want to break out of the house and be like, I'm not sure if this is going to work, I just want them to know my story and be able to come out here and learn with other combat vets how to do art. And if they're looking for one more way, if they just come out here and give me a chance, it's going to be worth it. What we were aiming for is to express what we were dealing with, you know, when we were deployed and during our military career, where we literally get out of our element, go on this kind of like alternate reality to go back in time, think about what we went through and express it to other people. Just being exposed to different concepts of art, like at the museum and some of the contemporary art we saw, um, that's what influenced me to try doing a performance piece for my last project. The opportunity to be at the school was just phenomenal. It was amazing. We could, at lunch, we could go and wander the halls of the museums and that was, that was pretty awesome. I think the hardest part was actually talking about what I've been through with. It was easy talking to Richard because he is a combat veteran and he has been through stuff I've been through. And my job was to, you know, go find IEDs or find landmines or anti-personnel landmines and take them apart. And little did I know, I was putting that stuff inside me. At first, it's a little hard to let yourself become vulnerable. Um, you won't really know what to do right away. It takes a couple days. I know for me, it took a week. Being surrounded by a bunch of veterans that, like, know what combat feels like, knows the after effects of combat, knows how it feels to come home. It was really comfortable being here. They're gonna come to class like normal college students, treated like normal people, that know how to be like, I can be in college, I am a normal person, and I can live like everybody else lives. If even one of them chose to go to college and study art and has that artist brain to where it saved them, it's totally worth it. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Um, so my name is Emily Christopherson and I will be showing you today how to um, trim and attach pieces that you have, or that I have, um, thrown on the wheel. So we did kind of a part one to this video uh, last week and I threw some stuff on the wheel and I wanted to come back and kind of show you how to finish those up. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Hello, Ben. Thank you for the sparks. Um, cool. So just to give kind of a quick recap um, through some pieces, um, my work is fairly simple. Um, so this is one of my pieces. This is just a cup. Um, I like to make these attachments to my pieces, and these are really mostly decorative. Um, so I'll be showing you how to do that today in addition to trimming. and. Um, yeah, we'll attach one of the larger pieces that I was working on, um, which I threw in two parts. So just to kind of get us started, I wanted to show you all how I make these little attachments. Um, I like to usually start off making the attachments before I trim, so that way they can kind of dry as I'm working and they're ready for me to, um, they're like ready for me to attach by the time I'm done. So just kind of a timing thing. Um, so we had a question, how big can I go? Ooh, um, I think the most amount of clay I've ever thrown with was probably um, probably 10 pounds, which actually isn't um, a huge amount comparatively, um, but the more clay that you add, the harder everything starts to get. Um, 
So I personally have done about 10 pounds. Might be a good challenge, um, maybe during this quarantine to, to try a little bit bigger. Yeah. Okay, so um, I've got a plaster slab over my wheel right now just to get started. I like working on plaster um, because it sucks up the moisture from the clay. So again, I want these pieces that I'm attaching to be drier than this. So right now this clay is really soft, really malleable. Um, I can manipulate it very easily, but I want it to be stiff enough when I attach it that it can kind of hold its shape. So I'm going to be working on this plaster, which will help me do that. So just to start, I'm going to kind of flatten it out into a disc or a patty. Um, I like to use these wooden dowels. Um, they're square, I don't know if you can see that, but they're about a quarter of an inch and what I'll do is I'll put them on either side of um, my clay and using my rolling pin um, I'll go over and roll it, but the dowels are really nice because it prevents you um, from like going too flat in certain spots or um, yeah, it's just a way to like keep everything really nice and even and consistent. So I know that every time I roll out a slab with these little sticks, they will be a quarter of an inch thick. So I'm just going to go ahead and roll that out. I like to go for like kind of a longer slab and then I'll kind of flip it over um, just to make sure the bottom is nice and even and I'll kind of give that a quick smooth. Um, wood has a similar property to plaster that it absorbs moisture. Um, so if you tuned in for our last video, uh, you would know that I use wooden boards to put my pieces on. Um, and I mentioned that those will absorb some of the moisture from the clay. Um, the reason that I'm not using my wooden boards to do this is because the wood will kind of, or the clay will pick up the texture from the wood, and I don't necessarily want that. Um, so I'm using this plaster just because it's a lot smoother of a surface. All right, so I've got my flat little slab. Um, I'm gonna take my needle tool next, which is just like a sharp pointy metal tool. Um, and I'm gonna go in and just kind of freehand my um, little, I like to call them little nubs. Um, but they're a lot of the times kind of uh, like a squiggle. Um, and so I, I go in and just kind of freehand those. So I'll make a couple of different kinds of shapes today. But I always start um, by just drawing kind of a straight line since the side that's being attached will be kind of straight up and down. Um, I just start with that straight line to get me going. Thank you, Almont 2000, for the sparks. Um, all right, so straight line down the middle, uh, and then I'll just kind of come in on either side and quickly sketch these out. If you did not see um, my first stream with Creative Ads, all of their videos are, or all of their live streams are recorded, um, and so you can go back and check those out on, I think, their Facebook and their YouTube. Um, so definitely, if you're interested, go ahead and check out that wheel throwing video, um, but they've got a lot of other videos as well if you haven't been following them. They've got some workout videos, um, music, kind of instructional videos, as well as some art instruction and demos. Shout out to Creative Arts for providing these um, streams during this pandemic. Um, so I don't know how much the camera is picking this up. I guess I can kind of hold this up for you all. Um, you can see I've got some of those sketched out. I haven't really used like this portion of the clay. Normally when I roll one of these slabs out, I like to kind of use as much of it as I can. Um, so I'll finish up on that other side and then probably do some extras kind of just to take up that extra space. Um, just a little bit more about myself, again, in case you didn't check out our first video. Um, I've been working with clay for about 10 years. I do mostly on the wheel. I do a little bit of hand building as well, so um, just kind of working with clay and your hands. Hi, Peggy Ryan. Welcome. Um, and yeah, I really, really enjoy it, obviously. Um, I went to school for it. 
uh, started off in high school, was very fortunate to have uh, an amazing program in high school to be able to learn. And yeah, just haven't, haven't been able to shake it. Definitely enjoy working with my hands um, and being able to make something out of it. A lot of my work is functional, so it's stuff that can be used, um, plates, cups, bowls. We'll be working on a couple planters today, some new ideas um, that I've been working on during this quarantine, uh, as well as kind of like a serving dish too. So playing, playing around a little bit. So I made some larger, um, larger nubs, and those would go on something more like a serving dish, um, just to keep it everything kind of proportional. So that's my slab. Um, I'm gonna set this on the plaster again, just to let that plaster start soaking up some of that moisture um, and drying out while I'm trimming my pieces. So I'm gonna tuck this to the side, get this out of the way while we trim. Um, I do have a couple of um, kind of prepped nubs already. I like to do this just so that um, sometimes the timing doesn't necessarily work out. Hi Patricia, welcome. Um, the timing doesn't always work out with those drying as I'm working. So I keep this uh, little plastic container from the container store, um, some plastic wrapped over it, and I keep kind of a little stash in here of pre-made ones. So I did get a little stir, stir crazy in the last time that uh, I was streaming, which was about a week ago. So I did go ahead and cut out some shapes for the pieces that we'll be working on today. So those are already kind of set. Um, and I'll show you later on, after we get those pieces trimmed up, how to go in and, and how I finish those. Um, so yeah, they once they're cut out of that slab, once they start drying, I'll go back and cut them out. Um, you can see that they are a little bit rougher. So later on today, I'll go in and show you how to smooth those out. Wrap those back up for the meantime. I wanted to talk a little bit too before we get started about um, how I've stored these pieces over the last week. Um, clay, if you let it just sit out in the air, um, will dry over the course of like maybe one or two days. Um, so I had to wrap all of my pieces to kind of keep them wet enough for me to work on later. Um, pottery is definitely an ancient craft. Um, there are pots that we have dug up from thousands, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and it's really humbling to be able to work with a material that has so much history. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. So I've got my pieces kind of over in this corner, I think you can see. They're covered in plastic. They were wrapped kind of airtight in plastic for the whole week. And that, again, just prevents the moisture from um, escaping them and keeping them in the um, state that we want them to be for trimming. So when I'm throwing on the wheel, the clay, again, is really easy to manipulate. Uh, I can pretty much turn it into whatever shape that I want to. Um, but once it's leather hard, um, so this is, we refer to it as leather hard. Um, it's I can kind of hold it and I'm squeezing lightly just with a little bit of pressure and it keeps its shape. Um, I can also kind of knock on it and it's uh, a bit drier. Hi John, welcome. Um, I am using a what we refer to as a cone six um, stoneware. So it's fired at about 2200 degrees and um, it's what I like to call like iron rich and so it turns this um, brown color after firing. And I get this clay body from Standard Ceramics. They're uh, a ceramic supply company. And let's see what's, again, I'm having this issue of not being able to see the full question. Can I use it and fire, or finish the project without a kiln? Um, so unfortunately with these pieces, I cannot finish them without a kiln. I will have to bring them um, back to my studio probably once quarantine is over um, and put them in a kiln. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term kiln, it's essentially, um, for lack of a better description, kind of like a large oven. 
So we put all of the pieces in to the kiln once they're dry, um, bring them up to that 2200 degrees, and that's what takes them from this kind of mushy, um, raw state into that hard, like ceramic that we want. So unfortunately, there's not a super great way if you're working with um, clay at home to fire it. Um, my best suggestion would be either to utilize kind of like polymer clay, something that you can fire in your oven, which I know has got kind of a different feel to it. Um, air dry clay is good. We have, or I know that Creative Vets did a, a video on how to work with salt dough. That's a good alternative too, just kind of something you can whip up at home. Um, if you are interested in using kind of more of a clay from the ground um, and working with that, I would definitely suggest checking out like a local studio. I know that's not definitely an option at the moment for a lot of us. Um, so I would say, unfortunately, you'll just have to kind of hold out and wait um, if you're trying to do this at home. You could also buy a kiln. That's a whole other, <laughs> whole other thing. Um, and actually, I had one of my friends just sent me a video online of a like microwave kiln, which I have my doubts about, um, but they exist. Seven minutes and your pottery is fired, which is kind of a crazy concept to me, but um, yeah. So I've got my leather hard piece um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start trimming this up. To do that, uh, I'm gonna take this and actually flip it upside down so the rim of the piece is on the wheel. Um, and what I wanna do is I want to recenter it on the wheel. What I mean when I say that is, um, again, we've got sort of this invisible middle point coming up from the wheel. Um, and we want everything to be rotating evenly around that. So I want essentially the middle of this piece to line up with that middle. So I'm gonna put it down on the wheel. I'm gonna do this a little bit more drastically just so that you all can kind of see it. Um, I'm gonna put it off center, turn on my wheel, um, and I'm gonna let it start rotating. So you can actually see visually that it's like making movement. Um, so when I'm trimming to get the piece as close to center as I can, I actually take my finger, and as that piece rotates around, the spot that it hits my finger, I'm gonna stop my wheel um, and push it in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna push it towards um, that direction. You can see now it's a little bit closer. Ideally what we're looking for is the piece shouldn't look like it's moving once it's on the wheel. Um, we'll know that it's spinning, but it shouldn't have kind of, again, that visual movement. So I'm just gonna repeat that until it's as close as I can get it. One thing I actually forgot to mention too is generally you want to, the first thing you wanna do is check the thickness of your bottom. So it's really easy, um, if you don't have a sense for how far down you can go, how much clay you can trim off, it's definitely really easy to go in and like trim through your entire bottom, which is always a bummer. So first thing is to check, and normally I'll do that just by putting my hand in the piece um, and kind of feeling with my fingers how much thickness there is there. So we're pretty close. I think I've just got a little bit of a wobble um, from when I was throwing, so I'm gonna work with that. Um, I need to grab a couple of lugs of clay real quick, which will help me keep my piece attached to the wheel. I just grabbed um, a little piece here. I want to kind of dry it out. It's it's pretty fresh, um, so I want. I'm just gonna kind of roll it in my hands. I'm gonna actually bring it over to my plaster and roll it on here. Um, the reason I'm doing this is if the clay is too soft, uh, it will kind of allow this piece to move around a little bit. So I just want to stiffen it up. And I'm gonna use these pretty much for every single piece that I do. So they'll kind of start to dry as I'm working too. Um, I'll kind of roll these into a little, um, I don't know, lug shape is usually what we call it. Um, and then with one hand, I'm gonna hold on to my piece to keep it in place. And then with the other, I'm gonna press these lugs of clay kind of down and around that piece, I think you can see it there. Um, and I use three pieces. 
I'm just going to do that kind of in a triangle around my piece. And then after I do that, I also like to just double check that that is still on center. Sometimes you can knock it off as you're attaching those pieces. So I always like to double check. Okay. The trimming tools that I like to use, I usually will use three different tools. Um, the first one being what we call a sure form. And this is kind of like a little mini cheese grater. It's usually, I think, used for um, woodworking, but it, it's a really great tool for working with clay as well. Um, and that's because it will take off kind of those finer pieces. So you can go in and take off a lot of clay. Um, you can also kind of get a nice curve with it. Um, and if you have any uneven spots, it's really great for working through those as well. Um, the second tool that I'll use is a little bit more of a traditional kind of trimming tool. Um, we call them like a loop tool. So it's just a piece of wire in this kind of shape. They come in a lot of different shapes, a, little, a lot of different sizes. This is usually my go-to just because it's larger and it will kind of cover more surface area. Um, they are a little bit sharp on the inside, um, which is perfect for kind of going through and cutting through that clay. Um, the third thing that I'll use is a metal rib. And this is really nice um, because it has a lot more flexibility. So this will do a similar thing to kind of the, the loop tool in the sense that it's that sharp metal edge which will cut through the clay. Um, this though is very rigid. So as I'm going along the edge of my clay, it's since it's flat, if I'm trying to create a round surface, it's always gonna have just like little facets um, or like little corners. So if I want that edge to be really smooth and rounded, what I'll do is I'll then come back with my metal rib tool, either bent, um, or you'll see I use a couple different um, ways of sort of bending it to get what I need out of it. Um, but this is really great for going back and just like rounding out that curve. So those are the three tools that I'm using. Um, yeah, let's do it. So again, starting off with the sure form, um, I like to kind of hold my piece in the middle here. Not always necessary, but um, just a habit that I've fallen into. So I just kind of keep my finger in that center point um, to prevent it kind of from, from toppling off of the wheel. And then I'm just going to come in with some pressure on the sides. Um, so as I'm sure you all noticed, that corner, that edge was very sharp. Um, and I'll show again kind of my final product, what I'm aiming for, which is this really rounded, rounded edge. So I'm going in and just kind of softening everything up. Um, also, I wish I had shown you before I attached it, but um, there's just some markings left from when I cut it off the wheel from um, the wire tool that I used to do that. So going in, um, I'm just kind of smoothing everything out, really refining it. So it's nice and even surface sort of all the way out. So I like to kind of come on that edge first, just get my general rounded shape. got all these little like chocolate shavings. Um, and then once I've got that edge kind of round, rounded out, I'll come in along the bottom. Um, with my cups and later with the planters too, I'm not taking away too much material. Again, I'm just really kind of coming in and using this as an opportunity to smooth everything out. Um, trimming can be a really great tool if you're first sort of starting to learn how to throw on the wheel. Um, like maybe your bottoms are a little bit thicker and you can use trimming as a way to go in and, and make the pieces a little bit lighter. It can also be a really great way, like how I'm using it here, um, to make some like stylistic choices. Um, because the shape of the cup, the look of the cup, is a lot different once that edge is rounded. Um, so yeah, you can kind of play up with different different styles in your piece um, through trimming. It's just another another tool to utilize. Was the movie Ghost your inspiration to work? I actually had not seen the movie Ghost until I started throwing. Um, so I was in high school when I had started throwing, hadn't seen the movie, um, but heard people kind of keep referring to that scene in the movie. And so I watched the scene and then eventually watched the movie Ghost, um, was not disappointed. <laughs> but it was not my inspiration. 
I have always kind of had an interest um, in clay. I remember when I was younger, um, like my mom would always buy me little Sculpey packs, little polymer clay packs from um, like Michael's from the craft store. And we would sit at our kitchen table and make, um, you know, she would teach me how to, how to make a little coil pot. Um, and so I've always, like I mentioned earlier, I've always enjoyed working with my hands. Um, and yeah, wheel throwing. I'm not sure where the interest came from, but it was just kind of always there. And once I found out that my high school had wheel throwing, it was definitely um, something I wanted to pursue. And it was a space where I just ended up finding a lot of people that I um, got along with really well. Okay, so I, as you probably noticed, I'm coming in now with my um, loop tool and kind of cleaning up that bottom. The sure form leaves, and I'm not sure if the camera picks this up at all, but it leaves um, like it leaves a texture to it. Um, so there are a lot of little lines that I want to go in and smooth out. Um, so I'm going first on the bottom, and then I'll kind of come in on the side. And then again, really work that bottom part, or that corner. You'll see me kind of leaning over a lot. That's because I'm checking the profile of the piece. So when I'm sitting up here, I can't really see that like outline of it. So I'm always, always stepping over that way. How long does it need to dry before firing? Um, it depends on kind of your climate, but um, if I leave these pieces out, they would probably be dry by tomorrow overnight. Um, so generally about, I would say like two, maybe one, one to three days, again, depending on your climate. Um, I worked in uh, or at a ceramic residency center uh, a couple years ago, and it was out in Maine. It was beautiful. It's called Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts. Great spot. Um, and they had a very rustic studio. So it was an old barn, and it was open to the elements. Um, you know, you could like see through the wooden slats <laughs> to the outside. Um, and there were days where, like, especially when it would rain, there were days where it was just like you would leave a pot out for um, the afternoon, you would throw it in the morning, come back at night, and it was still like you just took it off the wheel. Um, so again, really, really depends on your climate, but generally I'd say anywhere from one to three days. So what I'm doing now is I'm coming on the side of my piece, and um, thank you, Patricia, for that lovely comment. Um, with my with my loop tool um, and not trimming off a lot of clay but just kind of trimming off that surface layer of clay and I'll show you once I take this off why I do that um, but what it does is kind of exposes that clay underneath gets rid of that top layer um, of slip which was the water mixing with the clay when I was throwing it on the wheel and it just changes the like the visual surface of the clay. Uh, like I said, once, I, once I'm finished with this, I'll take it and bring it closer to you all with a comparison, just so you can see kind of the before and after. Um, yeah. So I've got something kind of exciting going on today. Um, I've been spending a lot of time during this um, shelter in place here in Chicago working on a new website. So I went in and kind of redesigned my website. Um, and I am launching that today, actually during our stream. So I'll be launching that at 12 o'clock. Um, I'll have a couple pieces on there for sale. Um, and it's just like a place to go out and check out some of my work. Um, so like I said, it'll be happening with you all if you're here um, at 12. And um, yeah, I'll be doing all that as well. Hello, Karen from Kenton Avenue in Chicago, welcome. Um, but my Instagram handle, if you are curious more about my work, um, is at Emrys Ceramics, it's E-M-R-I-S Ceramics um, on Instagram. And then the website, if you wanna check it out later, is www.emrysceramics.com. So yeah, check it out. Okay, I think I like the shape, but like I said, I'm getting some of that um, 
like faceting along this curve. So I'm gonna come in with my rib tool and see if I can smooth some of that out. I don't know if the mic is picking this up, but um, sometimes the clay is like just at the right point when I apply pressure to like whine. <laughs> it's always a fun, fun noise. Again, just really taking my time with this. Um, one, because we have all the time in the world right now, it feels at least. Um, but also because my form is so simple, um, it's hard to kind of hide those really small details. So I, I come in and really kind of almost to the point of like obsessively um, work through very, very minute small things. So I'm just going in and just making sure that everything's kind of how I like it. And I think that's looking pretty good. One thing that I did on the very bottom, um, instead of having it be perfectly flat all the way across, I kind of angled my tool in a little bit towards the center. Um, so that it's got a little bit of kind of an indent, a little concavity, um, which just helps it sit better on the table. Make sure that if it's like totally flat. Um, okay, I like this. So since I kind of go along the outside and trimmed that with this tool, um, I can only go so far down because of my lugs of clay here. So what I'm going to do for my final step is I'll take those off, keeping my piece on center. I kind of put those to the side. Um, and then I'll come in with my trim tool again, um, being as careful as I can not to press too hard and knock it off, um, since there's nothing holding it on except for my finger up top, um, and kind of trim all the way up to the rim, just so that is uh, that pattern is really consistent on there. Again, I'm just trimming off like barely anything um, just enough to kind of skim through that surface. And I'm going to come back to with my um, metal rib tool, just because sometimes that's a little bit gentler. Um, and I can get in some of those spots a little bit easier. All right. Looks good. The final, final step, I've got these teeny tiny stamps. Put them in the right way. Stamps with my initials EC, um, and I'll go ahead and stamp the bottom of my piece. Cool. Okay. We'll kind of clear those trimmings off. So let me grab another piece and I'll show you kind of the difference the before and after when you're trimming away that top layer. Ah, this piece is just stuck. So this is my after, and then this is my before. So you can see the, you just see the little kind of specks on the after. That's um, what we call grog in the clay. So clay has almost like little sandy bits in it, um, or sand-sized particles of hardened clay. And so what that trimming is doing is just kind of showing all those off. Um, a lot of my pieces aren't glazed on the outside, and a glaze is like a way to decorate the piece, but also a way to kind of make it food safe. Um, but I like to leave the outside bare and kind of highlight that clay. So this last step is pretty important to me just because it shows it off a little bit more. And you can see too, I've got those like fingerprints from when I took the piece off of the wheel. Um, so yeah, just a way to kind of go in and really refine that piece and make it a little bit more special. What happens to the wasted trimmings? Um, let's see, can they be used again? They can. So clay, um, before it's fired, can be recycled. So I can actually show you. I've got um, a bucket here that I will eventually put all my trimmings into. Um, and it's just kind of sloppy clay water right now. Um, but yeah, the, the clay, even if it's dried completely, um, if you add it to water, 
the clay will kind of break back down again, and through a process of what we call reclaiming, um, you can essentially recycle it. So all of these will be reused um, to make more pieces, hopefully. So yes, I'm going to set these aside. I'm going to cover it, just since we'll be making attachments later. I don't want it to continue drying out. So I'm going to put this back under my plastic, um, and we'll get to our planters. I'm excited about those planters. Okay, so here's our planter. Um, so that cup, for those of you who didn't see the first video, was about one pound of clay. I know I was talking earlier about um, sort of the most amount of clay that I've ever thrown. Um, this was about, I think, two and a half pounds of clay, so a decent size. Um, I'm going to check the thickness of my bottom of this piece, which I didn't do with my first one. I just kind of went for it. Um, and it feels like maybe we've got about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more. So I've got some leeway. Um, and then for this planter, I'm also going to cut a hole in the bottom too. So I'll trim that out. All right. So I'm going to start just by centering it on the wheel. And then we'll take our little lugs of clay. Since some of the trimmings get stuck in these, I like to kind of reshape them after every use. Holding my piece down and then just securing those in a little triangle, a little tripod. I used to do four, kind of one on each side here and then one on the other side. Um, but then I saw a video of somebody who did just the three and realized that that kind of tripod shape is a lot more stable because um, I was having problems with my pieces actually kind of like getting loose on the wheel, which is another reason why I hold them in the center too. All right, so starting off with my little shirt form, my cheese grater, rounding off that edge. Um, I was talking last week about how kind of meditative throwing on the wheel is for me. I would say trimming is also definitely very meditative. Um, and a lot of people who do throw on the wheel it's funny, either really like trimming or really don't like trimming, um, but I definitely fall into the category of sort of really enjoying it. Should need a lot of patience and a soft, I'm going to assume that's a soft touch. I can't, the way my screen is set up, I can't see the, the end of that comment. Um, but yes, definitely, definitely a lot of patience. Um, I talked a lot about this last week too, but um, a lot of kind of resilience to come back, um, especially when you're first learning how to throw on the wheel. Um, there's a test of patience and and um, a lot of failure. Clay um, is definitely, you have to get to know it, you have to get used to it. Um, so there's a lot of failure kind of involved in the first first goes, but even even still now, there's, there's a lot of failure. Um, there are some things that with the clay are just kind of out of your control and no matter how much you understand it, um, sometimes things just don't work. And it's a very, a very good lesson, um, like I said, in kind of patience and resilience in that respect. You get used to failure very quickly, <laughs> which, is, which is good. So I'm going to take the bulk of this bottom. Like I said, it's a little bit thicker, so I'm going to take the bulk of it away with my shirt form. Um, and one thing that I do to kind of see how thin my piece is, um, is I'll tap it. Um, and the different, like, how do I explain this? Um, the different sounds, so like a lower sound means that it's thicker versus a higher sound that means that it's thinner. Um, and you can also kind of feel, similar to a drum, you can feel the vibration that's coming back at you when you tap on it. Um, so the the more it vibrates, the thinner it is. Um, so I'm just using that kind of as a tool to get an idea for how far down I've gone and how much farther I'm going to go. And I'm doing a similar thing here with my planter, whereas I'm, I'm kind of angling down a little bit towards the center just to um, make sure that there's sort of this ring that's sitting on the table, which helps make it so 
that it just sits a little bit better. You might be able to see when it's at kind of the right consistency, your clay will almost kind of come off in ribbons, um, which is really fun to watch, but not fun to clean up later. to me. So I'll go along that outside edge and just kind of clean up that. This is a little uneven. When I took it off the wheel, this clay was really soft. Um, and so it got distorted a little bit. Um, my walls aren't totally round. So I'm going to come in actually, I think just to start with my metal rib so that um, I've got a little bit more flexibility with where I'm going. Um, so something that's important in both wheel throwing and in this trimming aspect as well um, is kind of keeping your hands or whatever tool you're applying to the clay really steady and stable. Um, so the goal is for this not to move um, so that the clay can kind of be altered underneath it, right? So if I'm kind of letting the clay push me around, if I have any uneven bumps here, um, you know, if I'm letting my hand move with the clay, ultimately I'm not going to kind of get what I want out of it. Um, so I'm applying a decent amount of pressure and again just keeping my hand really steady and stable um, so that I can change the clay versus the clay just kind of pushing me around. And that's working well. There's still a couple of weird spots so I'm going to come in with this and see if I can fix those. good as I'll be able to get this one. Um, this is kind of the first time I've made a planter out of this particular kind of clay. Um, it's also the first time I've made one this size. And I'm going to be adding some attachments again up first. Um, so I'm not super concerned. Definitely viewing this more as a prototype than something that I'll be selling right off the bat. Um, yeah. That outside looks good. Again, I'm going to come in and kind of round out this edge with my rib, get rid of those facets that were formed from the um, stiffer loop tool. Um, and sometimes what I'll do, if I know that something's going to be sitting on a table, this clay can be a little rough once it's fired. Um, so I'll actually take the smooth side of my rib and kind of smooth out the part that I know will be resting on the table, just in case it's on like wood or something like glass that can be easily scratched. Okay, now I'm going to go in and kind of trim that hole in my piece. And I'm realizing that I don't have a small trim tool with me, um, so I'm going to have to improvise here a little bit. I think I'm going to use my needle tool. My needle tool just to kind of score through. We'll see how this goes. Um, so this is really nice. I can make a perfect hole since I'm on the wheel, as long as it's in the center of my piece. Um, so I'm just going to start by kind of scoring it. So I'm going to gently just kind of scratch a line into it, right? I'm not going full force right off the bat. See if that's a size that I like. And I think we're good. Um, and I'll just, again, slowly 
kind of continue applying pressure until we get all the way through to the other side. Moving on me, it's jumping. All right, and we broke through. I don't know if you can see, but there's a little hole there now. So I'm gonna go in and just kind of clean up that edge since it's a little bit sharp. Again, it's all in the details. And I'm just doing that with my needle tool. Um, someone earlier asked what kind of clay I was using, and today I'm using, again, just this kind of, it'll look like this when it's finished. Um, it, it's got clay all over it, I'm sorry, I didn't wash it from last week. Um, but it'll be that kind of brown surface. Um, but you might notice that this um, little piece is a different color, and I actually use a handful of different types of clay. Um, so I'll talk about it when we start making attachments, but the attachments that I will be adding is a different type of clay that is a, a brick clay, and so it's a lot redder, kind of a red-orange color, um, and it has a lot more of that grog, of that kind of sandy clay in it, so it'll end up being a little bit rougher. Um, in a lot of my work, I like to, like I mentioned, just kind of highlight the clay itself, and so rather than using the glaze um, as like a way to decorate, I'll actually use the clay itself um, as that sort of special touch. And so I'll end up working with a couple different types of clay bodies um, and combining those in ways that I think are interesting. All right, so we've got a little hole on the bottom. I'm gonna take these lugs off. And ooh, I messed up. So this is, again, no matter how long you've been working, there's like always something to work through in your process um, in making something for the first time. So what I'm realizing is I want to continue kind of uh, exposing that clay on the bottom here, but I've also cut off the only thing, like that little hole right there, um, the only thing that I was using to keep it stable as I trim that, since I can't get to it when the lugs are on there. So I'll have to be mindful of that for my second planter. I won't trim the hole until the very last step. We'll see, we'll see how this goes. So I'm coming in with my rib just because I can kind of cut through a little bit easier or I can apply less pressure and still get a similar result. So coming in with my metal rib just kind of bent at a very, you can see that at a very harsh angle. Again with the line, if you can hear it. <laughs> it's a very mad pot. works for me. Cool. So there is our finished planter and we've got a little hole on the base. So I'll go in and stamp these as well. Our little prototype planters. And this is a little bit heavier on the base. Like I, I didn't take away a ton of clay on the bottom where I probably could have. Um, since it's a planter I'm not too concerned about it. I actually, as I was setting up for this stream, you can't see, but there's a kind of plant stand to the left of me. Um, almost knocked down one of one of my plants. So having a nice hefty base on a planter, I don't think it's a bad thing. So don't worry about it too much. Thank you, Patricia. I'm just going in and cleaning up that inside a little bit more. There was kind of a weird spot that I wasn't able to get while I was upside down on the wheel. Well, I'm going to set this aside. I think I'll trim both of the planters. We'll check on our um, little nubs that I sketched out. We'll check on those. Um, and then we'll probably actually start attaching the little nubs to each side of the planter. Thank you, Crucial Projects, for the sparks. So we'll just set that aside for the moment um, and grab our second one. So this one, the bottom is way, way thinner. Um, pretty thin, kind of scary thin. <laughs> like I won't be able to apply too much pressure while I'm trimming that. Um, but I've got a lot of kind of 
play in this corner that I can work on. So for those of you who are maybe just joining us, um, the first thing that I do when I'm trimming a piece on the wheel um, is I'll take it and I'll kind of feel the bottom just so that I know how much room I have to work with. And then just flip it over and we'll get it centered on our wheel. Sometimes while you're doing this, it will like just get worse. <laughs> um, it's kind of a never-ending like push back and forth, back and forth, um, with no clear end in sight. So sometimes you just have to accept that it's not going to be perfectly on center. And that's where I'm at with this piece. All right, so let's put these lines back up. everyone out there who's watching is staying safe and healthy. Um, I am currently in Chicago and um, we are at, under like a stay at home order. So you can only go out for essential business. Um, I am living with my partner and so I feel fortunate to have somebody else here. The struggle is real, crucial project, very real. <laughs> um, but I feel lucky to be living with someone, um, to have somebody to kind of interact with on a daily basis. Um, I feel fortunate for things like these um, where I can kind of connect with you all virtually. Um, and I feel grateful for organizations like Creative Vets who are making that happen. Um, if you don't know a little bit about Creative Vets and their mission, um, they provide a lot of art programming um, to veterans, and a lot of that programming is in person. And so they moved to these virtual, um, like online streams once the coronavirus kind of really hit the US. Um, because, as you may or may not know, um, you know, like for some veterans, it can be a hard time. Um, to have to social distance, um, to be alone, to be isolated. And um, so thank you to Creative Vets for kind of providing these resources um, for them and for anyone else today out there who's watching and enjoying. Um, hey, hello from San Antonio. Hope you all are doing all right out there. Um, I know it can be hard too, can definitely be hard being alone. Um, so I, you know, hope you all are kind of connecting with your, with your people virtually, but I also know it can be hard sometimes being stuck in a space um, with either your family or the people that you are living with. Um, so I hope that everyone is just kind of taking care of themselves um, physically, but also mentally as well. Um, so I'm being really careful with this bottom. Like I mentioned, it's pretty thin. Um, so I don't want to apply too much pressure or take too much of that off. Um, so I'm proceeding with caution. <laughs> And I can actually feel it as I'm working in, it's actually pressing down, like that divot is getting deeper. Um, just kind of stuck now. I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do here. It's great because it's going to be a planter anyway, so if I trim a hole through it, it that's what I wanted, right? Um, I'm going to come in with this and see if I can just kind of clean that up to the point where it's good enough. Again, this is just a prototype, so. Um, they'll probably end up in like a friend or family member's home. Um, not to say that I don't want my work to be perfect for friends and family members, but I also um, don't think that I'm going to be able to get this one perfect. And I love, be love being able to give them stuff that I'm kind of working through. Okay, I'm going to just like totally leave that bottom part alone from here on out. 
and we'll just work on the sides. It is 11.55, and in a couple minutes here, I am gonna, gonna pause just to do a little website launch, woohoo! Um, <laughs> so we'll kinda get what we done here. Get what we can do done before then. I don't know that that made any sense. But it will continue after that. That's not it's not all done after the after the website launch. So I'm I'm having a hard time too, um, because I normally use my finger here to apply pressure. I can't do that because I will definitely kind of bust through everything. Um, Mr. Two, thanks for the sparks. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of struggling through this one. Stay well and healthy. Thank you, Patricia. You as well. So again, I can kind of do the same thing with less pressure using this metal rib. The reason being, um, it's just a lot thinner. And I don't know if you can see, but it's actually actually hard to see this versus this, which you can see. It's thinner, so it's just going to cut through that clay a lot easier. Um, I forgot to mention, too, and I think maybe in some of the comments this is being posted, um, but Creative Ads has other videos in addition to this one. Obviously, you're here. You know about the live stream. Um, but all of those videos are recorded and can be viewed later. So all of the live streams that they've done to date, um, you can go back and watch. So you can watch how I threw these pieces. Um, again, they've got some kind of like health and workout related stuff, as well as some music stuff. Um, so if you're bored, go ahead and check those out. And they've got streams pretty much like Monday through Friday every week, if not one, um, like two. Um, so definitely check out their their profiles for more info about what's happening, what days. Um, and I think you can see their previously recorded videos on YouTube and Facebook. So check them out. Again, I'm just getting really nitpicky, nitpicky working on that curve down here. There's like a little bit of a bulge at the bottom, which I'm just trying to really work out right now. I might actually bring this shirt form back in. Um, what are you all doing to stay busy? Um, is there anything specific that you have taken on um, during this pandemic? Maybe you're still working. I am working a little bit. There's only so much that I can do from home. Um, but yeah, I definitely like to cook. I um, am by no means a chef, but I enjoy doing it. And so I tried doing some kind of like more at home cooking stuff. Um, just to keep busy and to have good food to eat, which is always important. <laughs> um, so I've been making some, or at the beginning I started making some like pizza dough and um, mm -hmm. like cinnamon rolls and was just kind of like really into the idea of trying to make my own bread from like a sourdough starter, um, which is something that I had been interested in sort of before this and this just felt like a really good time. Uh, you know what I think I just did? I just trimmed through the bottom of my planter. So, I don't know if you can see, but I went too far on that curve and the bottom is starting to come off. So, like we were talking before, failure is everywhere with, with clay, no matter how long you've done it. So this will just have to be recycled, unfortunately. Um, I, if I really wanted to, I could take this whole bottom portion off, roll a slab, and add that slab as the bottom. Um, I don't want to do that. I would rather um, just throw another one. So I'm going to go ahead and recycle this. Womp, womp. This, I really liked the proportions of this planter, I think, more than the other one. Um, so that's a little bit of a bummer. But like I said, it happens. 
we'll recycle it, we'll reuse it, um, we'll do it again, and we'll have learned more from it. So Patricia said working, um, which is considered essential for you, and taking lots of short walks. That's great. That is definitely something. Um, being kind of in the heart of Chicago, there are still a lot of people out. Um, so I've actually kind of been avoiding taking walks because I encounter a lot of people on those walks. Um, I'm definitely missing the outdoors. Okay, so let's see. Let's get our... I'm going to set this aside to recycle later, just since it's kind of the size of my bucket. We'll, we'll save that one and break it down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think I was talking about my sourdough starter. So I started a sourdough starter, and um, that's kind of been my like project throughout all of this. And um, the first one that I started wasn't really doing much. If you all don't know about sourdough starters, it's kind of like a natural fermentation or a natural yeast. Um, and so you have to let it kind of sit out and get bubbly, and mine just wasn't doing that. Um, and so I waited for two weeks and just kind of nursed it and took the cover off one morning to feed it, and it was like moldy. So had to throw it out, started a new sourdough starter, have yet to make any bread. We'll see if I can do that before quarantine is over. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear about what you all are doing to stay busy during this time. All right. I'm going to attach um, some pieces to these two. But before I do that, I guess I've got to get my stuff ready. So I'm going to set these back aside. I dumped the gun. I got excited. And I'm going to pull my plaster slab back onto our wheel. Okay. So for those of you who kind of joined later on, I made um, a slab, which is just kind of like a flat um, thin piece of clay. And I um, traced, just kind of freehanded, some of these little attachments that I'll be making. Um, so you can see in this example, I've got a little, a little nub, a little decoration. So I'm going to cut these out. I'm not going to use these. They are definitely not dry enough yet. Um, but I'll show you just kind of the second step of this. So I'll take my needle tool, just kind of slice down that line that I created. Oh, it is 12.02. Late for my um, website release. All right. So I'm going to pause real quick. I'm going to grab my computer. And I'll give you all, all the info on how to check out my website if you'd like to see my work. And um, there's some stuff up for sale up there. Stuff for sale up there as well. It's www.emrisceramics.com. That's E M R I S ceramics. And it is now public. Let me double check that it is. You can also check me out on Instagram. I'm at Emrys Ceramics. I'm trying to be good about posting, especially now that I don't have as much to do. All right, and we're live. Congratulations. Thank you for sharing this moment with me, you all. Um, it's very exciting. It was very fun to kind of go in and rework, um, yeah, just rework how I'm kind of presenting my brand and um, my business. So, exciting. Um, let's see, Patricia said that Pat made some awesome, let's see, oh, made some awesome sourdough bread. Awesome. Maybe I can talk to Pat. Pat is my uncle. Maybe I can talk to him about um, some sourdough tips. I'll have to give him a call. All right. I'm going to make a quick post to Instagram, letting the gram know, too, that the, the website is up. Right. We're doing it. We're doing things. Oh, thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to cut these out again just with my needle tool. I'm just going in and I'm tracing more or less some of the lines that I already drew. And then I've got just a little, little nub. 
Oh, Patricia. So my Patricia was saying my grandfather, Pat, made awesome sourdough bread. I see. Thank you, Karen and Patricia, for the well wishes. I appreciate it. Is out. I know it's kind of hard to see, maybe not the most exciting version of this, but it's important nonetheless. John was asking if we wanted to get into ceramics more in depth, what kind of wheel would you recommend getting? Ooh, um, well, there are a couple different options. Um, the one that I'm using is electric, so you just plug it in the wheel, use the electricity, um, and it's a Brent wheel. Let's see what the model is. Model B. Um, Brent is a really well-known um, wheel manufacturer, um, so I would definitely recommend anything that they make. There are different models depending on essentially the horsepower. Um, I'd say if you're just starting off and just getting into it, um, you wouldn't need something on the more expensive end or the more powerful end. Um, so something, I don't know their exact kind of model numbers and what the differences are, um, but Brent is great. Pacifica, I know too, um, makes a really good kind of like starter wheel. Those are definitely a little bit more affordable, I think, than the Brents are. Um, yeah. i say anything that's electric. If you really are, like, into woodworking, it might be a fun project to make a treadle wheel, which is uh, more of a manual wheel. And you use just kind of, like, leg power to, to keep it going. Um, it's similar to a kick wheel, which... Is exactly what it sounds like. You actually are just kicking um, the the base of the wheel essentially to turn the head of it. Uh, a treadle wheel I think is a little bit more advanced in the sense that you are kind of pumping a pedal which is helping propel the wheel so you don't have to do quite as much work. All along way John of saying I recommend getting an electric wheel and pretty much any um, any electric wheel should do you well. Um, kind of as someone who's, who's exploring it um, rather than doing it kind of more on a professional level. Um, the, oh, Patricia's asking me to please post my links. I will do that. Let me ball this clay up and I'll post it in the chat. Um, there are also some kind of interesting, John, um, like tabletop wheel models that have been coming out. I know there was one on Kickstarter. I don't know exactly what it was called, but I would just search tabletop throwing wheel. I know uh, there's a company called Shimpo that makes one as well. Those, I can't speak for like their level of power, but it also might be a little bit more of an accessible way to bring the wheel into your home. Um, they are a lot smaller. As the name suggests, they can sit on your table. Um, so it takes up a little bit less room. You can move it around a little bit more easy. Um, so that's another option too. All right, let me get these links in here. All right, so www.mrisceramics. And Cool. Check out those links that I just sent. Let me know if they don't work too. <laughs> okay, so I've got all my little all my little nubs cut out. Um, again, these are still a little bit too wet, so I'm gonna set these aside, let them dry, um, let them stiffen up a little bit, and I will pull out some of the pieces that I had already made um, previous to today's stream and get those pre prepared and show you how I do that them out of my little, my little box.
Okay, so I am doing the planter and the cup, and then we'll actually get the other ones ready too. What I like to do when I'm getting close to like the attaching point um, is usually I'll have, like as you can see here, a couple different, a lot, more than a couple, a lot of different options um, for shapes, sizes, proportions. So what I like to do is kind of take my pieces and hold them up to the form that they'll be going on just to kind of make sure that everything looks good. Um, and I'll have a couple different ones that I can like pick and choose. Um, so I have one of these that is actually already finished that I think would work really well for this cup. Um, again, I'm using a different clay body. So this clay that I was throwing with is my like brown um, stoneware. And then this clay, I don't know if you can tell the difference with it wet. It's a little bit lighter, but this is the brick clay that I'm using here. Um, so I think that is a good proportion. So I think I'll use this piece um, for my cup. For my planter, ooh, I'm having fun experimenting during quarantine. Um, I made these little more kind of floral, right, like suggestion of a flower. I don't know if you can see that. Um, or like what would be half of a flower attachment for the planters, just because I thought it would be a nice sort of reference to what the pot is being used for. So I have two different sizes here. This one's a little bit smaller. And so again, just thinking about kind of the proportion of the piece and what I think looks best on it. I think I'm leaning kind of towards the bigger ones. Small ones work well too though. Toying with the idea of doing one on another on side and having them be mismatched. That might actually be kind of interesting. And if I, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so again, just kind of playing around with it, um, not having super strict rules for myself um, and letting, letting stuff just kind of happen. Um, yeah. All right, so I've got my two pieces here. And what I did, I'll actually, I'll show you all real quickly um, on a piece that's already hard enough. Let me find one, a good one. Again, this is something really small, so it might be hard to see with our setup. But what I did with these pieces the other night is once they got to that dry, dry state, um, I went along with my... Um, metal knife tool um, and kind of cut off that square edge. So you can see on this piece right here, there's a really sharp edge. And what I wanna do is go in and kind of like round that out. So to get that started, I went in with, which I'll show you in a second, I went in with my um, my fettling knife, that's what it's called, fettling knife, and kind of trimmed off that edge just to start the rounding process. So, grab our fettling knife, and to do that, I'll just place it down on the plaster and at kind of like a 45 degree angle with my knife, um, I'll work away from me, kind of pull towards me and I'll rotate that um, piece underneath the knife as I work around those curves. And then these little bits can be kind of tossed in with my reclaim. And so that rounded out that edge and then I'll flip it over and I do that to both sides. Now I only do this to the sides that have the curves. I don't do it um, to that straight side since that straight side is just gonna sit flat on that cup. So now you can see that's got a little bit more of a rounded edge. And to go in and get really, really round and smooth, what I use is, um, drywall sanding screen. Um, so this is like sandpaper, or it has the same effect as sandpaper, but it's um, open. So it's kind of like a window screen. And what this helps 
with is sort of like if I was to use sandpaper that clay would just get clogged in the sandpaper. So this allows for a little bit of that clay to kind of like move through um, and just doesn't get as gummy. It's a really great tool for um, making really smooth clay things. So I'll go in around those edges. They come in like really long sheets. So this is a half sheet. Um, so they come in really long sheets. I like to cut them down to different sizes based on what I'm using for. This obviously is really small and intricate. Um, so I like to kind of cut off a smaller piece. So I'm just going in around that edge and sanding it, more or less. It does, um, it does get a little bit clogged, like those holes will get clogged, so I'll kind of move along the sandpaper as I'm working, or the drywall sanding screen, um, to different spots that are open, just because it tends to work a little bit better in those spots. I'll just kind of do a rough version of that all along the way. I've got this sort of like little crescent shape now that I haven't done before, so we'll see. I'm trying to think of the best way to do that. I don't think it's one. Um, but yeah, just going through and kind of sanding all of those edges. If you haven't noticed, the, the running theme, <laughs> rounded edges. Um, yeah, I really like kind of that soft continuous line. I think it feels really good in your hand. Um, and to mirror that in the details of the piece, right? So like I've got a rounded bottom and then all of these edges are rounded. Um, I think it's just a way to kind of pull it all together and make it feel very cohesive um, and intentional. So that's just a little bit of the kind of thought process behind those small judgment calls that I make. All right, so that was just one side. I'm gonna flip it over and do this next side as well. Feel free to shout out any questions if you have any. Um, this is kind of a, <laughs> again, not much stuff to watch here since it's super detailed. Then what I'll do is I'll just kind of set it down and um, run it flat across the little attachment. Um, I just find that it kind of gives me a, a both like a smoothing effect for the whole piece, but then it also just adds a nice texture. With the with the brick clay, I go in. Since it's really groggy and really rough, um, I like to kind of play that off a little bit. Um, so I'll go in with this and I'll leave all those kind of lines and marks versus the brown clay. Um, I like to go back with a sponge and really smooth it out. Um, so I got that inside seam. This is fun. 
I like this little form. It feels really delicate compared to the other ones, just because I've got these kind of really thin points. Um, and here I might make those thicker next time around. Again, all, all just a process. The more you make something, it kind of tends to subtly shift and change just based on the kind of amount of learning that happens. Um, your hands learn how to repeat the movement so you don't have to think about them too much. And that sometimes shifts things a little bit. Um, but also the, um, you can make intentional kind of changes based on, on what you learn from going through something once or twice or even a handful of times. So this was like thick. This, this point right here was pretty thick or kind of at a point where I thought I liked it um, before I went in and trimmed away that extra and then not sanding it. So just something to consider next time. All right. Yeah, I'm being really finicky. Just kind of going over everything and rounding out really little high points. I'll show you a little before and after. Especially with this red clay, it's um, pretty different. So this is the before, this one's the after. See, it just kind of roughs up that clay a little bit and how much smoother that looks. All right, so we'll do the second smaller one and then I'll show you how to attach these pieces. Um, I'm pretty excited. I think we might actually Um, I've got a little bit of work left to do, which I'll keep you all on board for, but I re I'm really excited to kind of see how this serving platter turns out. Um, for those of you who did not see part one where I threw these pieces, um, I threw kind of just like a large, low serving bowl um, and separately threw kind of a little stand for it, a little pedestal for it. Um, so I'll be attaching those today and seeing kind of how the proportions feel, um, but also trying out some new little kind of attachments, like with my planter. Um, yeah, it's good to, I don't know, it's always, it's always fun working through new ideas, but um, it's been hard for me to stay kind of motivated to keep working throughout all this, especially with the home setup. I'm so, so fortunate um, to be able to have a wheel at home. Um, the nonprofit that I work for, Art Reach Chicago, check them out. Um, they've got a fairly similar mission to Creative Arts using kind of art as a tool for, for healing. Um, but they allowed me to bring a wheel home from the studio and um, it has given me a way to continue making and continue working, but it's also hard to kind of find the motivation when you're at home, I am not a good, <laughs> like, um, I'm not good at having those two spaces be the same space all the time. Um, and it's also, clay can be very messy. I don't know if you can see here, um, but even what I'm doing here, there's a lot of like little dust particles. You saw the trimmings kind of flying onto the floor. And especially when you're throwing, there's just a lot of wet clay um, slop. And so the cleanup is a little bit more tricky in uh, a home setting, especially since clay isn't great to dump down your drain just straight, um, it'll end up kind of settling in your pipes. And so I've got to take some extra precautions sort of around that. And um, yeah, all of that just, just as a way um, to say that it can sometimes be hard, all of those extra things, it can make it a little bit hard for me to um, really want to do that. And um, having these new projects and new ideas to get excited about has been, it's, it's been helpful for me um, during all of this.
how long have I been making art? Um, I started working with clay in high school um, and have been working with it for about 10 years. Um, but I have always, I've always really enjoyed, um, like I mentioned, working with my hands um, and definitely doing like small arts and crafts projects um, at home when I was younger. Um, so yeah, I'd say making art generally, probably my whole life, um, but making art kind of in like a little bit more of a personal or business minded sense. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't know how to, how do I classify that separation? Um, I, I mean, I would say maybe when I graduated from, from college, which was about three years ago, four years ago. Um, but yeah, my work has also changed a lot since then too. Um, kind of ever, ever changing and ever, um, advancing. So yeah, a long time. <laughs> I think everybody, um, I don't know, even if you're not making art intentionally, every everybody has kind of a creative um, instinct, especially when they're younger. And whether that's just like thinking creatively for like creative solutions, um, maybe not necessarily like art related, but um, yeah. I think everybody's got it in them. So I definitely encourage anyone who's out there watching, if you haven't already done something creative um, during this quarantine, or maybe you aren't quarantined. Um, yeah, I'd encourage everybody to, to try something, even if it's something as um, simple as, I think Creative Arts um, did like a blind contour or like drawing games video. Um, but I would look up like blind contour drawings. Those are always fun, especially if you're at home with somebody or you can even do it on like a, a FaceTime or like Skype call. Um, it's a good way to just kind of like break through this idea of there's a, a good way to draw or a right way to make um, stuff and just kind of have fun with it. So I would look up blind contour like drawing demos and give that a shot. If you're feeling like you don't know how to, how to kind of you know, get started. Um, so my smaller piece has a little bit of kind of an angle to the point where I want to attach it onto my pointer. Um, so I'm just going to use the drawable sanding screen to kind of file that down. So that it's flat. And while I'm at it, I'll do that with the other piece too. Oh, and I just broke it. <laughs> so we had a casualty. That thin, thin spot came back to bite me. You guys are seeing a lot of my failures today, and that's okay. It happens. So um, unfortunately, what that means is we're going to have to um, start with the other one, which is why it's always great to have extras. So I'm going to go in and file this one down. Um, sorry, that kind of lengthens our time here doing this small, small piece. So this one is a little bit thicker, it looks like, at those joins. So hopefully we won't have the same problem. It's also definitely wetter. Even just sitting out that, I don't know, what was that, maybe five, ten minutes, um, out on that plaster really sucked up a lot of that moisture especially since it was kind of dry already. Um, yeah, too much pressure. Crucial projects with serendipity. Happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely serendipitous that we had a, a nice conversation about failure and I've broken a couple of my pieces. But I also think it's good to see, um, 
I don't know, I think it's good to see the accidents that professionals make um, because they happen. And like I said, especially with clay, but um, I, I teach some, I, I mean, I teach adults, but I also have taught some youth programming as well. Um, and the studio that I work at is a glass blowing and ceramic studio. Um, and glass and clay are very similar in the sense that you're working with a material that definitely has its own personality. Um, and you're kind of at the wits of, of that material. Um, and so with ceramics, as you saw, you'll trim through the bottom of your piece, you'll pick something up and it'll break in half. Um, or a project that you've been working on for a long time, maybe you left it to dry and the bag was open in one spot and it formed a crack and now you can't fix it. Um, glass is similar in the way that um, you're working with it in a hot state, so maybe it's cooling too fast and it ends up cracking and it like falls off onto the ground while you're working with it. Um, and a big thing that we sort of end up teaching um, both young people and adults who come through our space is sort of, you know, this idea of like letting, letting it go and embracing the fact that it's part of the process. Um, especially like sort of in those teenage years, it can be something hard to accept failure, but also like failure in a public space in front of your peers. Um, so it's always really exciting to see them kind of working through that. Um, and getting more comfortable with the idea of it. And, and sometimes kind of embracing it, you know? It's, um, yeah, sometimes it's just, it, it is a necessary part of learning how to work through something. And, um, We've got the sides of this cleaned up. I'm going to go ahead and clean up that inside portion. Before I do that, and I should have done this before anything, I'm going to flatten the bottom just in case I snap this one in half too. Sometimes the decisions are made for you, right? Like if I was to break this one, it just means that we're only doing the small piece. Sometimes it's like that. All right, so that's flat. We'll do the inside. So to do this kind of inside portion, I'm wrapping my, um, or kind of folding my drywall sanding screen onto itself. Since it's a little bit stiffer, it tends to kind of like round, I don't know if you can see that at all, it like rounds out a little bit, kind of in like a teardrop shape. And that's really great to go in and just get those like smaller corners or um, small bits. I'm realizing that I probably should have covered this little part that's sitting out as well as this one. I think they'll be okay. I think we get to touch them fast enough. Um, I've got like a heat vent right above me um, in my apartment, and so that is working against me. Um, yeah, just something, again, to think about when you're working with clay. If it's drying, drying as it's sitting out. I like it. I think we're in a good place. I say as I keep working on it. Um, we're close though, we're close. So I've got a really fine layer of kind of dust here, which I don't want to set my finished pieces down onto. Uh, I don't know what to do with this. Oops, set this in there. So I'm gonna grab a sponge and just kind of quickly wipe that down. Otherwise, 
those little pieces will kind of um, sink into you know, the hard pieces. I don't want that, all that hard work I just put into it. All right. Well, it's attaching. So the most important thing when you are attaching two pieces of clay together in this like what we call leather hard state or um, the state where they're dry enough to pick up and handle without squishing but also still have a little bit of moisture in them um, is slip and slip is a clay and water. Um, talked about recycling clay before so a lot of times you'll see them sloppy um, clay in a bucket um, and I'll use this Act sort of as like a glue between the two pieces um, as I'm joining them together. So I'm going to take my cup first. Um, I'm going to wrap these little plant pieces up so that they don't dry out too much. And I want my lid wet. So I'll take my piece, and again, just kind of hold it up in a spot that I, I want to put it, which I think is right about here. Um, I'll make sure that it's on there straight. I'll kind of hold on to it, and then I'll take my needle tool, and I'll give just a light trace to right around those edges. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to go in and rough up the two surfaces that I'm joining. Um, if anyone's ever worked with, like, I don't know, tile or um, if you've even used like super glue on something that's smooth or glossy, um, they'll kind of recommend roughing it up just so that the two things can adhere better. Same thing with clay. So I'm going to go in and do what we call scoring. So I'm taking my needle tool and just creating like little hash marks in that clay um, and roughing up that surface where I plan to attach my piece. And I'm going to do that to both sides. I'll do that to my little attachment as well. And then I'll take some of my slip on my reclaim. Um, and I want to put enough on there so that I kind of can't see those lines anymore. Um, sponge. My hands are all dirty now. Um, one important thing for me at least when I'm doing this trimming and attaching, um, since my work is fairly clean or I try my best to kind of focus on the surface of it and I want it to be really clean, um, working with clean hands definitely helps serve that end product. So as much as I can, trying to kind of clean my hands from any slip, so that way when I go to pick up my piece, I don't get that covered in slip too. Um, so I've got my little attachment, it's got slip on it, and I'm gonna just line it up on that little surface I scratched up. I'm gonna press down and wiggle it a little bit. Make sure again that it's straight, kind of line it up. And then you can see that that clay that slip that we used to attach kind of squished out the sides. So what I'll do is find my tool. I'll be right back. Um, or no, I think I've got something over here I can use. I got a pencil. That'll work. Anything with kind of like a rounded or sharp edge. I don't want to use my needle tool because that's too sharp, um, but this pencil should do just fine. I'll go in with this and kind of scrape all that extra slip off. I'll just wipe that onto my sponge. I'm going to do a combination of that and my settling knife, just because some of that slip got onto my red clay. Um, usually, so this is where we're having like different clay bodies. Thank you, Man Boys Black Sparks. Um, 
Having different clay bodies will can kind of get tricky, especially when I'm attaching them. So what I like to do is I like to use the slip for whatever kind of clay the form is. So in this case, I'm using the brown clay slip. Um, so if I get that brown clay slip onto my red clay, um, it's essentially covering up that red color. So you'll be able to see the difference once it's fired. So I'm going back and just making sure that that red clay is exposed and doesn't have any brown on it. It's funny, I'm using this pencil and so I'm getting like graphite on my piece, but it'll all burn out actually in the firing, so I don't have to worry too much about that. I'm just going around this entire edge and I'm removing some of the slip, but also what I'm doing at the same time is kind of compressing that slip around that um, edge, which will make sure that that attachment doesn't end up cracking there later. So I'm going in and really kind of pressing everything down together uh, and making it nice and happy. Nice and happy to be one instead of two. Okay, so this is, this was our before. You can see that slip kind of coming out and then this is our after going in and just cleaning that up. So I'll do that to the other side. And then we'll do it on our planter as well. I think we'll end up going uh, definitely over, I, I think we had said two hours for this one but um, we're gonna go over. So if you all are in here for the long haul, I hope you got some time. I just really wanted, I wanna show you all that serving dish. I'm excited about that one. And that's our cup. Cute. Cool. Um, let's attach the planter. Little planter dudes. So we'll get that up here. After I've attached pieces together, I will. Um, they would probably be okay if I just let them sit out and dry right off the bat. Um, but what I like to do is sort of an extra precaution. Is I'll actually wrap them airtight again in plastic overnight just to let those two attachments sort of reach the same moisture level. Um, a big reason that clay cracks while it's drying um, is sort of a different in drying, difference in drying rate. So um, if one side is drying faster than another, the likelihood that it's going to crack is just creating a lot more tension. And so the likelihood that it's going to crack increases. Um, and it definitely increases with those um, attachments that you're making. I think we just got, oh, awesome ketchup sets and sparks. Thank you. Um, yeah, when you're making attachments, the likelihood, since those two things weren't together in the first place, the likelihood of them cracking get greater. So I'll wrap them airtight, let the let everything kind of even out, um, and then let them dry slowly. So a kind of a controlled drying, rather than just letting it sit out. If it's something that doesn't have an attachment, right, like if I was done with this planter and didn't put anything on the sides, I would just let it start drying. Um, totally uncovered, totally free. Um, but we're not gonna do that. Okay, something that I wanna decide, my um, attachment has kind of like an uneven, this top part goes up higher, the shape is just a little bit different. So um, I have to decide sort of which shape I want facing up. Again, a really, really small thing. Um, but it ends up making a pretty big difference in how the piece looks at the end. Um, and what I'm noticing too is it looks like the attachment isn't sitting quite flat on my planter. And that's because my planter is not totally straight up and down. This one was the wonky one. So I'm going to take my feta knife and just try and cut that down a little bit. 
get it to mesh well with my image. So I'm going to do the bigger one up top, kind of up here, and then we'll do the smaller one down here. Oof, I'm excited. So this, uh, this isn't totally actually, depending on where I put it, the planter, it's even, and then in different spots it's not. So i got to find a good spot for it, which I think is right here. Now this one's going to be tricky because I've got that little like inside part to smooth out. Again, I'm going in, I place my piece and I'm, or my attachment and I'm tracing it so that I can take it off and I've got little lines to know where to, to score my piece. Um, the reason I'm trying to be pretty exact about this in my situation is because um, I went to the effort to kind of trim that outside surface. Um, if I hadn't done that, it would be okay if you got slip kind of on the outside. You could just go in and smooth it in with like a sponge, but I'm really avoiding trying to mess up that surface just because it's hard to replicate um, if you're not like actually trimming it, if that makes sense. So I'm really trying to preserve that. So just being very intentional about where I make my marks because I won't necessarily be able to fill them. Nice little dollop on both sides. And oops. it's a fish. <laughs> I'm also, as I'm pressing down, I'm trying to press down pretty lightly because I'm nervous after that first one broke <laughs> from me pressing on it. So I'm being gentle. And they feel attached really well. That's fun. It might have been a little bit high, but I think having that smaller piece will kind of balance it out. We'll see. So I'll take my pencil, try to go around those edges. Like I was mentioning before, keeping my hands really clean, but I'm also, as I scrape that stuff away, going in and cleaning my tool so that every time I go in to use my tool, um, it's clean and not spreading that slip around even further. So all these very, very little things that can have a big kind of influence on, um, on yeah, how everything turns out. First point done, we'll do the second one.
his little, um, the kind of like part on the inside is really tricky to get to. It's also just hard to see what's happening in there too. And that's one of those moments where I um, kind of, <laughs> where I kind of realize how obsessive um, I can be sometimes because it's like, if I can't even really see in there, like no one's gonna be up close kind of um, inspecting this. Um, yeah, it still feels like a very important thing for me to take care of, so we're doing it. Okay, I think we're done with that first one. So let's get the second one on. The small baby. Yeah, I'm trying to decide just which side I want up. They are a little bit different. And I could if I wanted to, right? I can kind of play around. They don't have to be right equally um, across from each other, right? I can kind of play around with their proximity. Since I only have two, I think I will kind of keep them on either side, but just something to think about for the future. Okay, and this is always the struggle is making sure that they're straight. Straight across. Kind of hold it there and give it a quick trace over here on my side where I don't think you all can see. I think that was a little bit more. Yeah, that one wasn't quite as clean, but it's okay. So I'm scoring that surface, we're really roughing it up. Just gonna dust off those extra pieces. Still do the same. Attachment. Grab some slip. I have to remember which way we're doing this. I think it was that way. And my book is very watery, so I think like this is kind of a big layer of water on top. I'm having to dive deep for that slip. We got it. Come in and make that contact point, make that attachment. Ooh, I just broke it. <laughs> they are already attached, so I think I'll just go in and fill that crack. Um, but that was definitely um, pretty dry. It had been sitting out. Good to know, good to know. So we'll clean this up first and then I'll grab some um, some of the brick clay trimmings and, and make a quick slip with that and fill in that crack. That is an example of something that might come back to um, haunt me later, right? I might fill that in, it might look good to go um, while it's wet, but as it starts drying, that crack might come back. Only time will tell.
some repair me. Um, gotta find my other slip. Or, um, trimmings. So someone asked earlier if you could recycle the trimmings, or what I do with the trimmings, and, you know, this is what they look like totally dry. Um, so all I'm going to do, I'm going to grab the lid from my small container and kind of use this as a palette. Um, but let me make some room. What I'll do is I'll just take some of these um, and add water to them. And you all will actually be able to see kind of how that dissolves and breaks down. Um, so I'll just grab a small sponge and I'll just squeeze a little bit of water. And when they're really, really dry like this, um, they absorb that water really quickly, kind of like a sponge would. Um, and then I'll just take my knife here. I don't know if you can see that. Just absorb all that water and we'll just give it a quick mix. And this feels a little bit wet. I want it to be a little bit thicker, so I'm going to grab some more trimmings. Sprinkle those in. The reason um, I added more trimmings was just because the more water that's added to the slip, the more it's going to shrink because it's losing. Um, that water additive. And so as it's drying, the more that it's shrinking, uh, again, the more room there is for cracking because there's more tension. So I don't want it to be super watery and runny because as it's drying, um, it just increases that likelihood for that crack to come back. So I want it to be kind of pretty thick. Sometimes um, clay artists will use like vinegar or um, what's the other one? I can't remember, but vinegar is a really popular one for um, mixing up slip just because it evaporates differently than the water does. I don't know the exact science behind it, um, but from what I understand, it lets the clay particles kind of move and get loose the same way water would, but it doesn't... Um, as it dries, the clay doesn't move as much as it would if it's mixed with water. So if this crack ends up becoming a problem later down the road, what I'll do is I'll do the same exact thing, mix up um, some slip, but instead of water, I'll use some vinegar, um, or sometimes just rub vinegar kind of straight into that crack, and that um, will help. It's not always a surefire solution, but it helps. Okay. I'm just going to go in and with my knife, fill in those cracks. I'm sad because, again, I'm going over that kind of texture that I worked to get, um, but we can go in, in this case, and kind of re-add it back. Although I don't know how much I want to fuss with the, this piece since it does seem to be pretty delicate. Okay, and now I'm gonna come in with my pencil and just really compress that clay in there. We want to fill that crack. If there's any sort of hint of that crack later on, uh, again, as it's drying, the clay, I talked about this um, in the last stream, but clay has uh, like a memory almost. So if there's a crack there, it'll start to kind of spread. The, the rest of the clay will follow suit. And so if I can fill in this crack and pretend that it never happened, <laughs> um, that clay will hopefully stay together through the drying process. Just really working in there, again, with light pressure, not too much, to kind of compress that slip in. And I can't see it anymore now. Um, we will just have to wait and see as it dries. Sometimes too, even as it's being fired, right? Like it won't be an issue, but it'll come out of the kiln. It's continuing to shrink in the kiln and solidify. Um, and so sometimes that will pop back up. And at that point you can't recycle it. All right, I 
think we did it. <laughs> we, uh, we had many complications getting here, but we've got um, a new little form, a new little printer. Cool. All right. I'm going to start on our serving dish. So setting these aside, I'm going to get them under the plastic. Um, my base was on a bat before, but it's um, just kind of like a hollow piece, or a, it doesn't have a bottom to it. Um, so I'm just going to pull those pieces out. I should probably get this out of the way first. Uh -huh. I'm put this here. This is going to be trickier to trim. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is actually kind of hand trim most of it. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'm going to hand trim some of it now, and then really just do finishing touches on the wheel as I'm trimming. So I will actually wipe off my fettling knife and come in. I'm going to actually do this over my slip bucket. So you can see that edge is really rough. It's a little bit thicker and kind of flares out. But what I'm aiming for is something that's kind of round and smooth like that top side. So I'm going to take my fettling knife I just kind of come in and start carving that away. This is a little on the drier side, so I am going to be careful with pressure since the theme of today seems to be me breaking everything. Um, we're going to try to avoid that for now. So I'm just taking my time, working pretty slowly. You might be able to see how that's starting to just kind of crisp it up compared to that raggedy edge. I don't know if you can see that. Sorry if you can't. But I'm kind of coming in and trying to cut essentially so that that edge will be flat with um, the wall. It'll be all kind of even. I'm having a hard time with it. This clay is kind of dry. I just switched to my left hand. I'm a lefty. Shout out to any fellow lefties out there. Um, <laughs> but it definitely makes a difference using your dominant hand. I think I'm just going to focus on this inside part. The outside part I'll get um, trimming on the wheel, but this inside was a little gnarly. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to trim this second. I'll start with the serving dish, get that all shaped up, and then then we'll move on to the second part. Again, this is the first time I've ever done this form or like made this form, um, so I don't have kind of a, a plan. I have a, a, an idea of how it'll go, um, but there's still some, some things that I'm working through. I don't know exactly what makes the most sense yet. So I'm going to start by, but I think starting by doing that serving dish first is the way to do it. I'm going to move this. Crucial project, left dominant, but we'll paint with my right hand at times. Yeah, I um, will kind of switch off 
sometimes as well. I feel a little bit like being a lefty in kind of a right dominant world. Um, some of us have to kind of adapt. I know there are people who are definitely more left, like strictly left-handed, um, but I'll switch off sometimes. Not necessarily with writing, but with, um, with other stuff. Okay, so again, just kind of coming in, feeling my bottom so that I don't trim through the bottom like my last planter. <laughs> feeling how much leeway I've got. I'm also thinking about the curve, the interior of this, right? So it's got a pretty distinct curve and then a flat portion. And I want that to line up with what the outside profile looks like. Um, in a perfect world, right, this would this wall would be even throughout. And while I'm trimming, I want to aim for that. It doesn't always happen that way, but um, that's our goal. So I'm just taking note of all those things before I turn it over and can't really feel that out anymore. So we'll get it recentered on our wheel. Make my wheel turn off. So this, if I remember, was a little bit off center when I threw it. So I'm having to kind of make the decision um, of how off center I'm going to let it be. And I think we're good. I think we got it in a good place. Joshua Van Camp, the good of wheel. What do you mean by that? All right, so I'm grabbing my legs of clay. These have been sitting out, so they're starting to get a little bit drier. Um, so I'm trying to find the not too dry um, sections. And then I kind of roll those out into our little lugs. It's kind of lunchtime, so I'm thinking about how these remind me of Milky. Maybe I'll go make some pasta <laughs> after this. And I'm pressing those down and in while holding my piece on the wheel to make sure that it stays on center. And then I'll just double check again to make sure it didn't move too much. All right, coming in with our sugar form, our cheese grater. Yeah, this is definitely off center. And the way that I can tell that um, is because one side of my piece right now is higher than the other. So this might be hard to see, but as it comes around, it hits my finger here. But as it keeps spinning, I end up getting space in between here. Um, this is where the shirt form comes in a lot of handy because it's kind of really finely taking clay away and has an easier time smoothing out those kind of um, inconsistencies. Um, since this will have like a little pedestal to stand on, I am not, if, if you um, just joined us earlier, I was kind of creating a little bit of um, a concave bottom, but this one, since it won't be sitting directly on the table, I'm going to keep it pretty straight across since it'll be sitting just right on that pedestal. This was, I had 
a good amount of thickness at the bottom here. So I'm gonna try without fear on this one. <laughs> Although that's how I ended up breaking the other one. I thought I had more leeway than I did. I also, um, you all might be noticing this, but I also use this hand kind of as a way to keep this hand really steady. Um, so you can see that thumb's kind of touching down. Even just that small contact point actually makes a big difference in my ability to keep my hand stable. Um, a lot of potters, you'll see their hands are always kind of touching each other um, as they work and that's why. So I'm just going in and cleaning out my, um, my shirt form. It's getting clogged a little bit, so it's not working quite as well. Yeah. So I don't know if you can hear that difference. And it changes as you get to the size, especially with this full form. But we want it to kind of be as even of a sound as we can throughout. So I'm going to keep trimming. All right, so I'm starting to be able to feel a little bit of vibration as I'm tapping, which means that I know that the bottom is in a good spot. So I'm not gonna take too much more straight off of that bottom. And I think that side is sounding really good too. Also a good way to check is just by like looking at it um, and seeing if that curve kind of matches what you remember from the inside. Um, yeah. Sometimes too, you'll end up taking the piece off, realize that maybe one part was a little bit heavier or thicker, and you can always put it back on the wheel and keep trimming. So that is a, a nice part about doing this trimming process. With wheel throwing, once you've taken it off the wheel, it's pretty next to impossible to put it back on and keep working on it. But with trimming, you have that option. All right, I'm gonna come back with my loop tool, start smoothing stuff out. It might be a little like squeaky and screamy. I apologize. And sometimes just if the clay is like at a right dryness, um, it'll like catch that metal in a way that <laughs> makes that lovely noise. See, we've got, oh, I just broke it. But we did have like a nice long little ribbon. Ooh, satisfying. <laughs> it's fun too, sometimes they'll like curl up. You can see a little curl, a little spring. come in with my metal rib and um, smooth out all those facets. The metal rib 
room sometimes also gives a little bit of a different finish. It, it can be a little bit rougher on the clay. Um, which, depending on how I'm feeling, I do or don't like. So at this point, I'm going to take my um, pedestal, and it's upside down, but I just want to get a sense for what it looks like. That's pretty fun. Cool. Um, what I'm also going to do, I'm debating whether or not to trim this on its own or attach the two and trim later. Welcome, Thin Big J. Thanks for the follow, and Yanni Pop. Thank you for the sparks. Um, so yeah, I can't decide how I want to do this. And I think it would probably, given my track record today, um, I've broken a few things. I think I'll probably do them separately, um, just because I feel like that might be kind of a bit of stress on the attachment if I do it that way. So my bowl is good. Uh, I'm going to take that off. I'll make sure that it's kind of good and even all throughout. Oh, actually, I want to do that, um, the rim. I want to trim that up, too, just to get that texture even throughout. Sorry for the, the screaming coming from my clay. <laughs> Paying a lot of attention to, oh, to the form, and I think I just made a big gash in there. <laughs> okay, we smoothed it out. All right, feels pretty good. It's a little bit thicker on the bottom than I expected, actually, judging by the um, way it was feeling, but I don't think I want to push it any further. So, we'll set this aside for the moment. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. So, I want to do two things for this. I want to make this edge, it's really rounded from when I threw it, but I want to make it pretty flat so that um, it's really flush against the bottom of the bowl. And then I want to clean up this bottom portion as well. I think I'm going to clean up, I think I'm going to do the top first, just since this base right now is kind of at its widest. So I'm going to recenter this on the wheel. This I know when I took off definitely got warped, so it's not going to be perfect, um, but it'll be as close as we can get it. We'll grab our little lugs. Thank you, Crucial Project. Uh, and we'll get this secured down onto our wheel. Uh, and all I'm going to do, I'll start with actually with the shirt form and just hit that rim. Again, to make it really sharp. So kind of doing the opposite of what I've been doing the rest of this stream. It's also helping to even it out. That rim was a little bit higher on one side than the other. Um, so it's just going to make everything nice and nice and crisp. Sorry for the squeaking. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take my bowl now and set it down on top. Just make sure that it's setting well. And it looks pretty good. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I think my bowl is a little uneven. We'll see how this goes. I'm going to move.
move this up top here. Um, something else I just thought about too is I want the surface to be the same um, on here. So I do want to go in and trim this surface as well. Which is hard. I like normally have my hand in the middle, but there's nothing to put on there. I think I'm going to switch over to my grip tool. The roof tool isn't quite cutting it. It's not kind of exposing those um, little specks the same way that this other tool is. So I'm gonna have to switch back. All right, looks good. Wonderful. So we'll flip this over. I like to spin fast at the end just to kind of get all those extra trimmings off. Thank you, Crucial Project. Thank you, Awesome Ketchup. I'm very excited about this new form. Um, and I hope, once this quarantine is over, to make some and have them available on my website. Um, if you just joined us, I actually launched my, um, relaunched my updated website today at 12. Um, so you can check out some of my finished work um, at emrisceramics.com. So it's www.emris, E-M-R-I-S, ceramics.com. Um, yeah, pretty stoked about it. Okay, so I just flipped this over. We're going to recenter it. And then we'll trim out this bottom. And um, plugs are getting a little bit harder. So probably grab some new fresh clay, but thank you, Crucial Project. I appreciate it. All right, I'll trim up these edges. And this bottom, so this will be the bottom once it's sitting on there. And I want that to be kind of rounded out. We had a lot of extra bulk. Um, since that's what was attached to the wheel, there was definitely a lot of extra flare down there that I don't want to keep. So coming in, really smoothing that out. And I'm kind of starting to, my feet are starting to kind of come up as I'm doing this. So I'm having a hard time kind of keeping it down with the amount of pressure that I'm applying. I'm going to stop for just a second. I'm going to kind of reapply pressure to my lugs just to make sure that those are kind of holding stuff in place. Sometimes this happens when the lugs start to get too dry, they won't quite hold on. Or if you just have an awkward piece right now, I'm applying a lot of pressure sort of on the outside and it's wanting to spin like a top. So we're just going to take it slow. It's working nicely for this. A lot thinner, so it's cutting through that clay much easier. And I'm not having to apply as much pressure.
All right, focus, in the zone. <laughs> really trying to get that edge the way that I want it. It's not quite happening, but um, I think we might just have to work with it. Now, there we go, all right. So I was able to go in with um, this back end of my loop tool, and that actually really did the job. So I was just trying to get that those sides, again, really even. Um, I was having a hard time doing that. So we've got that. We'll kind of round out this rim a little bit now. I'm actually going to grab my knife tool. This has also got like sharp enough of an edge that it'll kind of cut through. And then I think what I'll do is I want to take just a damp sponge and hit this bottom um, to kind of smooth it out. And again, I don't want that to be super, super um, rough because it will, ah, I think I just stuck my, <laughs> I just stuck my foot in my slip bucket. <laughs> oh man. Um, I don't want that to be super rough because that will be the part that's sitting on the table. Look at that, my slipper. Um, that's the part that'll be sitting on the table and so I don't want it to scratch up, um, whatever it's sitting on. So I'm going to hit it with a sponge, just kind of soften that a little bit. come back on the outside just to make sure our texture isn't gone. And that's it. So now we can get to attaching these two pieces together. And I actually kind of, while it's here, I just want to play around a little bit and see what it would look like if it was inverted in the way I originally intended it. Which I don't not bad, but I definitely don't like that as much as the other way around. It might be hard to sort of tell the angle from where the camera's at, but um, it's sort of a difference between the angle going in like this or out at the bottom. And I think I prefer it going out. Okay, so we'll kind of get all these trimmings out of the way. And what I'm going to do for attaching these two um, is I'm actually going to place my bowl back upside down. <laughs> Crucial project is in tears at my foot in the slip bucket. Yeah, that's going to be a fun one to clean up. <laughs> so I'm going to take this, flip it back over, um, recenter it to attach the face. So another aspect of um, growing at home is We've only got so much room at the studio. Obviously, that's the only thing it's dedicated to. And so there's a lot of room spread out. Um, everything kind of has its place. Here, everything's kind of a little bit more cramped around me. Um, and so it's just a little bit harder to maneuver. All right. So I've got that centered. And now that that's centered, I'm just going to place this on without attaching it and center this bottom portion to make sure that it's all kind of centered throughout. Um, thank you, Crucial Project, for the um, sparks and LOL, awesome ketchup. Yep. So I'm just going to make sure that that is centered on my serving dish. Let's see, I'm going to look at it in the video. It looks pretty good. So from here, I'll take my needle tool, if I can find it. Huh. There's like only so many places that, oh, it's right back behind me with our little cutouts. Okay, so I'll take my needle tool and I'll score, um, while the wheel is spinning, I'll just score along the edge of my bottom on both the outside and the inside. 
and then I'll just use this as a, a template to go in and, and score. So scoring, for those of you who are maybe just joining us, um, is kind of roughing up the clay. So I'm using this needle tool, which is really sharp, um, and just making little lines in that circle that I just drew. And I'm doing it in one direction, and then I'll go back the opposite direction as if I was making like a tic-tac-toe board. And this is like a very small, wide line, so it's taking a little bit more time. So we went all the way around one direction, and now I'm going to go the other direction. Um, one tool that's really good for this, not particularly here, but like if I was to, when I start scoring on um, my second part, is something called a serrated rib. And it looks exactly like the metal rib, except that round portion, instead of that being smooth, it's got little, like, zigzags, um, little teeth almost. And that's really a great tool for roughing up a lot of surface quickly. I don't have one of those with me at the moment. So we're doing it the, the analog way. Okay, and we'll kind of dust off those extra burrs. Um, and then I'm gonna do the same thing, go around and score my edge here. So once I get these two pieces attached, I do have some little um, cutouts that I want to add to the sides as well, kind of similarly to the planter and the cup. Um, so I'll go ahead and attach those. And I think from there, we will call it, because I'm hungry, it's time for some lunch. around all the way with the first set of score marks. Getting close. <laughs> and then we'll go around again. Back in the other direction. Um, one thing I had thought about, hi Maximus003, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, one thing I've thought about too in kind of playing with the different clay bodies um, is actually doing the bowl and the pedestal in different colors. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely follow me on Instagram um, to see if I make that dream a reality. Thank you, Mandalay Black, for the banana sparks. Or no, those are scissors, sorry. Need to get, <laughs> need to get my eyes checked. My eye appointment got uh, rescheduled. June because of COVID-19. All right, this is so tedious. <laughs> I will say, I don't love every part of the scoring process, and that was definitely a part that I am not a fan of. Um, especially when you start getting into like production and you're making a lot of these and having to do that repetitively, it can get a little, um, a little dull, I guess, for lack of a better word. So I'm grabbing my slip, even though I got plenty of slip on my shoe, <laughs> and I am going to coat this edge pretty liberally. Um, sometimes when you're slipping and scoring, I didn't really do this, but you'll do both what you're attaching and what you're attaching it to. 
Um, I don't need that much slip. Just because I'm not smoothing that slip in, I'm kind of really going back and removing any of the slip that squeezes out the sides. So I'm just coating one side with enough that I know will really attach and secure those two pieces um, without doing too much. Glob. All right, they're all nice and slipped up. I can't see any of those lines. Go ahead and clean my finger. And again, since this is like the bottom of the piece and I really want to keep it as centered as I can, I'm following this line that I just created for myself, but um, definitely really wanting to stick within those parameters. So I'm going to get it this close to where it was before as I can. Applying my pressure, giving it a little bit of a wiggle. And I'm going to give it a quick spin. Still pretty on center. So I'm happy about it. All right. From here, I am going to take my, I think I'm going to take the um, fiddling knife. And I'm just going to, while it's spinning, kind of smush and smear all that extra slip into that crevice so that it's nice and sealed up. And it doesn't look like that tool is maybe a little bit too wide, so I'm going to take the back of my, the back of my needle tool, which has kind of got like a little 90 degree on it, and try using that instead. Again, just smushing all that slip in there, really smoothing it out. making sure everything's really sealed up. All right, the inside's looking pretty good, so I'll go ahead and do the same thing to the outside. Which I might have to switch back to my fiddling knife too big for this angle. I'm also just kind of going to go in with my finger. Sometimes your fingers are the best tools. Oh, so full at it. I'm kind of smudging it up now. So I'm going to come back with my flip tool and just clean that up. Um, I'm going to go in with a little bit more slip. It just doesn't seem like that seam is closing, um, which is really, really important that it does. So I'm coming back with slip in some of the areas that it doesn't seem to be filling. I'm just filling those kind of manually. There we go. 
wonderful. Again, just going back to kind of clean up that extra slip. Looking pretty good. I think that is good. Oh, I want to clean up the inside. Hold on, hold on. Sweet. So I'm going to leave it like this still, but um, I'm going to grab the little attachments that I have. They kind of look like hearts a little bit. Uh, let's see. Let's do these. And these are going to live sort of in the corners here. And I've got another set. Let me see if the shape is better on one or the other. They're pretty similar, but one's just a little bit more squared off, and one's a little bit more rounded. I think I kinda like the rounded one more. So we'll go with that. Thank you, Karen Lynn, I appreciate it. Okay, so these aren't quite the same angle. These are pretty much a 90 degree angle and this angle is a little bit um, more acute. Ooh, geometry, or not the geometry term. Um, so I am going to make sure that those fit nice and snug. And then once I've got that angle right, I'll go in and I still need to smooth out the edges of my attachments. So I'll grab my fettling knife, um, or actually I'm gonna grab my sure form just so that I don't take off too much of the clay. I've had it where I like start doing it and I'll take some off and then um, I'll take off too much and then I have to take off more and then by the end of it, there's just no, there's nothing left. Um, so I just wanna be really intentional about what I'm taking away especially since I have two of them, they need to be, they don't need to be, I'd like them to be kind of as even as they can, as they can be, at least in this case. Ooh, that's pretty close. There's also some slight curves, like this comes off around the edge a little bit, so I'm trying to match that curve as well. I think that's pretty good. So that one's set, we'll get this other one shaped up. Um, again, for these attachments, I'm using the brick clay. So these two pieces are the brown stoneware, um, and then the little attachments are the brick clay. So it'll be a nice little pop of orange. Okay, that's feeling pretty. No, I need to work on my bottom line.
Okay. I think that's looking pretty good. All right. So I'm going to take a minute just to smooth those edges out with my drywall sanding screen. Um, and then we'll attach them. And then this will be done. Very exciting. Okay, so go along that flat edge, just kind of rough up that surface. I think actually too, since this is a little bit larger, I take my fettling knife, which will have this sort of the similar effect of trimming it and kind of try and scrape that surface off. It'll reveal those, um, those pieces of grass on me. working. It's like not totally a flat surface, so it's a little wonky, but <laughs> so this was the before. And then this is after. I'm not sure if you can tell the difference. It's just a little it's got a little bit more roughness to it. A little bit more speckling too. These pieces were a little bit wetter, so they're kind of gummier, like they want as I'm uh, using the drywall sanding screen, the little pieces really want to stick onto themselves, um, which isn't ideal, but gotta work around it. So there are even there are like nuances even to something being leather hard, right? So something can be at the softer end or the harder end of leather hard, and they kind of come with their own. Um, like pros and cons, um, lots of nuances. I think that one is done. I'm going to go ahead and attach this first one just to get it on there um, and then we'll really fiddle with that second one. I don't, I don't remember which way is up and down. Oh, we'll figure it out. I think it was like that. Let's double check. No, I think it was this first way. Let's hope. All right, so I'll go ahead and trace that with my needle tool.
Hmm. I actually need to adjust it a little bit more. From where I was sitting, it looked like it was good to go, but I need to round out this um, bottom edge a bit more to fit with the curve of the bowl. No. This is where we get into, um, thanks man Glidstock for the sparks. So remember we get into like, take a little bit off, take it off at the wrong spot. Now you're filing away your piece to nothing. Tricky, tricky. So something like this down the road, right? If I end up kind of like starting to produce these, um, this is something that would end up taking a lot of time and something um, very finicky that I would kind of want to cut out. Um, so if you had a general shape and I knew that this was always going to hit the curve, I might take my piece um, like this and uh, create a little template for what that curve would look like. So that way I don't have to go through and do this every single time. Um, All right, that's close. Closer than we were before and close enough for me to be satisfied. <laughs> so I think the rest of it we can just kind of fill in the slip. So I got my piece right in front of me, making sure it's as straight as I can, grabbing my needle tool, giving it a quick trace. And then we'll come in and start scoring. super hard to see. I'm also in the dark. Like my hands on my face. Okay. Score this up. Grab some slip and we'll attach it. Frosting our little clay cake with some icing, with some slip. I'm going to double check which direction it's going on so that it's going the right way. It's a little bit harder to tell what those ends look like with the slip on there. You can't take something off um, when it has been attached. Like if, if I was to put this on wrong, I could take it off. I just don't want to have to do that. Beyond decorations, um, do the little pieces add stability? Not necessarily. Um, they, I mean, I see, I see why you would think that since it is kind of in that corner of attachment. Um, I don't think they add enough that it would like function or have that function. Um, Yeah, so they are mostly decorative. Um, something interesting though to think about is sort of this like, the like idea of stability and how our brains process how things look. Um, so something like this might give you the illusion that it is more stable um, when in actuality it might not be providing that function. Um, in that way, if that makes sense. Um, a lot of the times it's like very impressive or um, coveted to like be able to throw something very thin on the wheel, um, which is definitely a demonstration. Sorry guys, I'm looking for my pencil. <laughs> it's definitely a demonstration of your level of skill and ability um, throwing on the wheel. But I also find for myself that I don't always love a super thin cup because it feels feels less substantial, feels like um, 
I don't know, like I will break it more easily. Um, stuff like that. So again, kind of going into the psychology of how things feel or how they look and how our minds kind of interpret them. Um, so I like to throw my cups just a little bit thicker um, and for them to have a bit more heft so that they feel a little bit more substantial. This is hard to get in here, get in here and clean up. I'm gonna have to switch to my right hand. Thanks for the questions, Crucial Project. That was a good one, that last one. They're all great questions, but that one, I, I always enjoy questions that I have to think about that I don't have the answer to immediately. For anyone who's been watching since the beginning, thanks for hanging out with me for like the last three hours. <laughs> Just got one last attachment to go and then we will be wrapping up today. down one to go. So we'll kind of clean up our last attachment or round it out. Had some weird weather today in Chicago. It snowed overnight and um, it was kind of snowing this morning and the sun's kind of been peeking in and out of the clouds. So it looks like everything is melted. Weird, weird times. Definitely good to get some sunshine though.
this side's cleaning up a little bit easier just even with that couple of minutes extra that it um, adds to thing out. Small pieces like this will dry out really, really quickly. Give the sides a quick little wrap up. I'll grab my rib and scrape that just top layer off to expose some of that frog, some of that grittiness. Thanks to everybody who's joined in today. Um, this is my second time streaming and it is uh, way, way fun. Um, so thank you all for being here. Sides are scraped. I'm just going to do a final little brush over my sides. Alright, and I think we're ready. Again, it's always always hard to make sure that they're totally even across. Sometimes what I like to do is I'll grab one of uh, like either a ruler or one of these um, sticks that I used earlier to rule out my slab. See, so how I had it before looked like it was pretty even, and I just put that stick down and it was definitely off. So <laughs> I'm gonna have to adjust that a little bit. It's a helpful guide. Uh, we'll do a little quick little mark around. Oh, I need to make sure it's straight, which it looks pretty good. Quick little score. Ah, upside down. <laughs> score the attachment. Grab some slip. get this one into place. I'm going to swing it around here so I can use my left hand. Give it a little wiggle, a little pressure. Making sure it's straight. Alright, and 
that's on there. So something actually that's kind of fun about this dish, I, I'm leaving the bottom open. Um, so in theory, if you wanted to, you could use this top portion. I'm not sure exactly what um, it would function as. Maybe you could use it for like a little bouquet of flowers, um, but it does have a little bit of an aspect of like a double function if, um, if we wanted to use it that way. So I think for this one, I'm actually going to pick it up. It's going to be a little bit easier for me to get into those um, nooks just to be able to kind of um, manipulate it. I don't know why I didn't do this last time. Crucial Project asks, um, if I have the kiln in my home, I do not. Um, I was lucky enough that my employer let, let, or allowed me to um, bring this wheel back with me. Um, I do not have a setup here in my home for a kiln. Um, there are electric kilns that you can plug just into a regular outlet, um, but some of them do need a specific electrical hookup. So. I uh, will have to bring these pieces back to the studio at some point, um, probably once the shelter in place is lifted. So for now, we'll just kind of hang out here. It is kind of dicey um, because they'll have to, you know, go in a car and be transported in a state when they're the most fragile. Um, so some of them might not make it, but definitely better to be able to make something than nothing um, during this time. So yeah, normally I, I don't have a um, studio set up at home. I do all of my work um, in a communal studio. That studio is called ArtReach, um, ArtReach Chicago. You can check them out at www.artreach.org, or artreachchicago.org, sorry. Um, it's another nonprofit. We do ceramics and glass blowing. Um, Yeah, you can learn more about us on, on the website. Um, working with Clay, you definitely, I mean, there are, are a number of private kind of studios that people work out of, but um, given the nature of the equipment that you need um, and sort of the accessibility to that equipment, uh, a lot of it is pretty expensive, and so working in a communal space and uh, either taking classes or renting part of the studio, like a shelf, um, oftentimes can be um, an easier way to um, have access to the materials and um, equipment. Plus, I think it's just a nice aspect of clay then that you are always kind of surrounded by people. As an introvert, that can be a little hard sometimes. Um, but I think just being able to be around people while you're making, even if you aren't um, necessarily like engaging with them in, in conversation can be 
also a really therapeutic aspect of, um, of working with clay. Yeah, like I said, just by nature, it does tend to be pretty communal. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I find a lot of comfort in that. I've had a lot of, a lot of really great friendships and mentorships um, come out of working with clay in those communal spaces. We're almost there. Okay, I think you're done getting any extra slip off the sides of my red clay. All right, let me clean this wheel off. And this is our finished serving dish. Let's give it a quick little spin. Yeah! That's fun. I like the proportions of it. I think um, when I was making it, I wanted this base to be a little bit wider. And now seeing the two of them put together, I actually think I might want it a little bit narrower just because these um, attachments, and I guess I could play with the size of the attachments, but those attachments add a lot of width to it as well. Um, so yeah, something to play around with. But first version of um, this new serving dish idea that I had in quarantine. Um, so thank you all again for sticking with me today. I know it was a little bit longer of a session, um, but thanks for joining in um, when you did and if you did. And yeah, I guess that's it for today. Uh, like I said, my website and Instagram, give them a follow if you want to see what else I'm up to. Um, during quarantine and if you want to see later on maybe some finished shots um, of what this piece and the planters and how those all turn out. Um, thank you all so much and yeah enjoy the rest of your day. Hold on awkward awkward like transition into technology. <laughs> Bye. Help combat disabled veterans tell their story through art. We enroll them into the best art institutes in the country. We pay for their tuition, their housing, their food all three weeks so that they can finally tell their story through art. We also bring combat disabled veterans to Nashville, to places and rooms like this here at the Grand Old Opry, to tell their story for the first time with pro songwriters all about the things that they went through that they've never been able to talk about before. These programs have been extremely successful in helping veterans combat their PTSD. Right now, CreativeEdits has more veterans applying for our programs than we do funding. So if you can go to creativeeds.org and donate, we would appreciate it.